Part 2, Chapter 2 of Introduction to the Devout Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dylan P. Straub. Introduction to the Devout Life by St. Francis de Sales. Chapter 2. A Short Method of Meditation. And first, the presence of God, the first point of preparation. It may be, my daughter, that you do not know how to practice mental prayer, for unfortunately it is a thing much neglected nowadays. I will therefore give you a short and easy method for using it, until such time as you may read sundry books written on the subject, and above all, till practice teaches you how to use it more perfectly. And first of all, the preparation, which consists of two points. First, placing yourself in the presence of God, and second, asking his aid. And in order to place yourself in the presence of God, I will suggest four chief considerations, which you can use at first. First, a lively, earnest realization that his presence is universal, that is to say, that he is everywhere, and in all, and that there is no place, nothing in the world, devoid of his most holy presence, so that, even as birds on the wing meet the air continually, we, let us go where we will, meet with that presence always and everywhere. It is a truth which all are ready to grant, but all are not equally alive to its importance. A blind man, when in the presence of his prince, will preserve a reverential demeanor if told that the king is there, although unable to see him. But practically what men do not see they easily forget, and so readily lapse into carelessness and irreverence. Just so, my child, we do not see our God, and although faith warns us that he is present, not beholding him with our mortal eyes, we are too apt to forget him and act as though he were afar. For while knowing perfectly that he is everywhere, if we do not think about it, it is much as though we knew it not. And therefore, before beginning to pray, it is needful always to rouse the soul to a steadfast remembrance and thought of the presence of God. This is what David meant when he exclaimed, If I climb up to heaven, thou art there, and if I go down to hell, thou art there also. And in like manner Jacob, who, beholding the ladder which went up to heaven, cried out, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not, meaning thereby that he had not thought of it, for assuredly he could not fail to know that God was everywhere and in all things. Therefore, when you make ready to pray, you must say with your whole heart, God is indeed here. The second way of placing yourself in the sacred presence is to call to mind that God is not only present in the place where you are, but that he is very specially present in your heart and mind, which he kindles and inspires with his holy presence, abiding there as heart of your heart, spirit of your spirit. Just as the soul animates the whole body and every member thereof, but abides especially in the heart, so God, while present everywhere, yet makes his special abode with our spirit. Therefore David calls him the strength of my heart, and St. Paul said that in him we live and move and have our being. Dwell upon this thought until you have kindled a great reverence within your heart for God, who is so closely present to you. The third way is to dwell upon the thought of our Lord, who in his ascended humanity looks down upon all men, but most particularly on all Christians, because they are his children, above all on those who pray, over whose doings he keeps watch. Nor is this any mere imagination. It is very truth, and although we see him not, he is looking down upon us. It was given to St. Stephen in the hour of martyrdom thus to behold him, and we may well say with the bride of the canicles, he looketh forth at the windows, shewing himself through the lattice. The fourth way is to simply exercise your ordinary imagination, picturing the Savior to yourself in his sacred humanity, as if he were beside you, just as we are wont to think of our friends, and fancy that we see or hear them at our side. But when the blessed sacrament of the altar is there, then this presence is no longer imaginary, but most real. And the sacred species are but as a veil from behind which the present Savior beholds and considers us, although we cannot see him as he is. Make use of one or other of these methods for placing yourself in the presence of God before you begin to pray. Do not try to use them all at once, but take one at a time, and that briefly and simply. End of Part 2, Chapter 2Part 2, Chapter 3 of Introduction to the Devout Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dylan P. Straub. Introduction to the Devout Life by St. Francis de Sales. Chapter 3. Invocation, the second point of preparation. Invocation is made as follows. Your soul, having realized God's presence, will prostrate itself with the utmost reverence, acknowledging its unworthiness to abide before his sovereign majesty, and yet knowing that he of his goodness would have you come to him. You must ask of him grace to serve and worship him in this your meditation. You may use some such brief and earnest words as those of David, Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Shew me thy ways, O Lord, and teach me thy paths. Give me understanding, and I shall keep thy law. Yea, I shall keep it with my whole heart. I am thy servant, O grant me understanding. Dwell, too, upon the thought of your guardian angel, and of the saints connected with the special mystery you are considering, as the Blessed Virgin, St. John, the Magdalene, the Good Thief, etc., if you are meditating in the Passion, so that you may share in their devout feelings and intention and in the same way with other subjects. End of part two, chapter three. Part two, chapter four of Introduction to the Devout Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dylan P. Straub. Introduction to the Devout Life by St. Francis de Sales. Chapter 4. The Third Point of Preparation, Representing the Mystery to be Meditated to Your Imagination. Following upon these two ordinary points, there is a third, which is not necessary to all meditation, called by some the local representation, and by others the interior picture. It is simply kindling a vivid picture of the mystery to be meditated within your imagination, even as though you are actually beholding it. For instance, if you wish to meditate upon our Lord on his cross, you will place yourself in imagination on Mount Calvary, as though you saw and heard all that occurred there during the Passion. Or you can imagine to yourself all that the evangelists describe as taking place where you are. In the same way, when you meditate upon death, bring the circumstances that will attend your own vividly to mind, and so of hell, or any subjects which involve visible, tangible circumstances. When it is a question of such mysteries as God's greatness, his attributes, the end of our creation, or other invisible things, you cannot make this use of your imagination. At most, you may employ certain comparisons and similitudes, but these are not always opportune, and I would have you follow a very simple method, and not weary your mind with striving after new inventions. Still, often this use of the imagination tends to concentrate the mind on the mystery we wish to meditate, and to prevent our thoughts from wandering hither and thither, just as when you shut a bird within a cage, or fasten a hawk by its lures. Some people will tell you that it is better to confine yourself to mere abstract thought, and a simple mental and spiritual consideration of these mysteries, but this is too difficult for beginners, and until God calls you up higher, I would advise you, my daughter, to abide contentedly in the lowly valley I have pointed out. End of Part 2, Chapter 4 Part 2, Chapter 5 of Introduction to the Devout Life This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dylan P. Straub Introduction to the Devout Life by St. Francis de Sales, Chapter 5, Considerations, the Second Part of Meditation. After this exercise of the imagination, we come to that of the understanding, for meditations properly so called are certain considerations by which we raise the affections to God and heavenly things. Now meditation differs therein from study and ordinary methods of thought, which have not the love of God or growth in holiness for their object, but some other end such as the acquisition of learning, or power of argument. So when you have, as I said, limited the efforts of your mind within due bounds, whether by the imagination, if the subject be material, or by propositions, if it be a spiritual subject, you will begin to form reflections or considerations after the pattern of the meditations I have already sketched for you, 
and if your mind finds sufficient matter, light, and fruit, wherein to rest in any one consideration, dwell upon it, even as the bee which hovers over one flower so long as it affords honey. But if you do not find wherewith to feed your mind, after a certain reasonable effort, then go on to another consideration. Only be quiet and simple, and do not be eager or hurried. End of Part 2, Chapter 5《Part Two, Chapter Six of Introduction to the Devout Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Nathan Cameron. Introduction to the Devout Life by Saint Francis de Sales. Part Two, Chapter Six. The Third Part of Meditation, Affections, and Resolutions. Meditation excites good desires in the will, or the sensitive part of the soul, such as love of God and of our neighbor, a craving for the glory of paradise, a zeal for the salvation of others, imitation of our Lord's example, compassion, thanksgiving, fear of God's wrath and of judgment, hatred of sin, trust in God's goodness and mercy, shame for our past lives, and in all such affections you should pour out your soul as much as possible, if you want help in this, turn to some simple book of devotions, The Imitation of Christ, The Spiritual Combat, or whatever you find most helpful in your individual wants. But, my daughter, you must not stop short in the general affections without turning them into special resolutions for your own correction and amendment. For instance, meditating on our dear Lord's first words from the cross, you will no doubt be roused to the desire of imitating Him in forgiveness and loving your enemies. But that is not enough, unless you bring it to some practical resolution, such as, I will not be angered any more by the annoying things said of me by such or such a neighbor, nor by the slights offered me by such a one. But rather, I will do such and such things in order to soften and conciliate them. In this way, my daughter, you will soon correct your faults, whereas mere general resolutions would take but a slow and uncertain effect. End of Part 2, Chapter 6 Recorded by Nathan Cameron Part 2, Chapter 7 of Introduction to the Devout Life This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Nathan Cameron. Introduction to the Devout Life by St. Francis de Sales. Part 2, Chapter 7. The Conclusion and Spiritual Bouquet. The meditation should be concluded by three acts, made with the utmost humility. First, an act of thanksgiving, thanking God for the affections and resolutions with which He has inspired you, and for the mercy and goodness he has made known to you in the mystery that you have been meditating. Secondly, an act of oblation, by which you offer your affections and resolutions to God, in union with his own goodness and mercy, and the death and merits of his Son. The third act is one of petition, in which you ask God to give you a share in the merits of his dear Son, and a blessing on your affections and resolutions to the end that you may be able to put them to practice. You will further pray for the church and all her ministers, your relations, friends, and all others, using the Our Father as the most comprehensive and necessary of prayers. Besides all this, I bade you gather a little bouquet of devotion, and what I mean is this. When walking in a beautiful garden, most people are wont to gather a few flowers as they go, which they keep and enjoy their scent during the day. So when the mind explores some mystery in meditation, it is well to pick out one or more points that have specially arrested the attention, and are most likely to be helpful to you throughout the day, and this should be done at once before quitting the subject of your meditation. End of Part 2, Chapter 7 Recorded by Nathan Cameron Part 2, Chapter 8 of Introduction to the Devout Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Nathan Cameron.
Introduction to the Devout Life by St. Francis de Sales Part 2, Chapter 8 Some Useful Hints as to Meditation Above all things, my daughter, strive when your meditation is ended to retain the thoughts and resolutions you have made as your earnest practice throughout the day. This is the real fruit of meditation, without which it is apt to be unprofitable, if not actually harmful, inasmuch as to dwell upon virtues without practicing them lends to puff us up with unrealities, until we begin to fancy ourselves all that we have meditated upon and resolved to be, which is all very well if our resolutions are earnest and substantial, but on the contrary hollow and dangerous if they are not put into practice. You must then diligently endeavor to carry out your resolutions and seek for all opportunities, great and small. For instance, if your resolution was to win over those who oppose you by gentleness, seek throughout the day any occasion of meeting such persons kindly, and if none offers, strive to speak well of them and pray for them. When you leave off this interior prayer, you must be careful to keep your heart in an even balance, lest the balm it has received in meditation be scattered. I mean, try to maintain silence for some brief space, and let your thoughts be transferred gradually from devotion to business, keeping alive the feelings and affections aroused in meditation as long as possible. Supposing someone to have received a precious porcelain vessel filled with the most costly liquid which he is going to carry home, how carefully he would go, not looking about, but watching steadfastly lest he trip or stumble, or lest he spill any of the contents of his vessel. Just so, after meditation, do not allow yourself forthwith to be distracted, but look straight before you. Of course, if you meet any one to whom you are bound to attend, you must act according to the circumstance in which you find yourself. But even thus, give heed to your heart, so as to lose as little as possible of the precious fruits of your meditation. You should strive, too, to accustom yourself to go easily from prayer to all such occupations as your calling or position lawfully require of you, even although such occupations may seem uncongenial to the affections and thoughts just before forming the part of your prayer. Thus, the lawyer should be able to go from meditation to his pleading, the tradesman to his business, the mistress of a family to the cares of her household and her wifely duties, so calmly and gently as to not be in any way disturbed by so doing. In both, you are fulfilling God's will, and you should be able to turn from one to the other in a devout and humble spirit. It may be that sometimes, immediately after your preparation, your affections will be wholly drawn to God, and then, my child, you must let go the reins, and do not attempt to follow any given method, since, although as a general rule your considerations should precede your affections and resolutions, when the Holy Spirit gives you those affections at once, it is unnecessary to use the machinery which was intended to bring about the same result. In short, whenever such affections are kindled in your heart, accept them, and give them place and preference to all other considerations. The only object in placing the affections after the points of consideration in meditation is to make the different parts of meditation clearer. For it is a general rule that when affections arise, they are never to be checked, but always encouraged to flow freely. And this applies also to acts of thanksgiving, of oblation, and petition, which must not be restrained either, although it is well to repeat or renew them at the close of your meditation. But your resolutions must be made after the affections, and quite at the end of your meditation, and that all the more because in these you must enter upon ordinary, familiar subjects and things which would be liable to cause distractions if they were intruded among your spiritual affections. Amid your affections and resolutions, it is well occasionally to make use of colloquies, and to speak sometimes to your Lord, sometimes to your guardian angel, or to those persons who are concerned in the mystery you are meditating, to the saints, to yourself, your own heart, to sinners, and even to the inanimate creation around you, as David so often did in the Psalms, as well as other saints in their prayers and meditations. End of Part 2 Chapter 8 Recorded by Nathan Cameron Part 2, Chapter 9 Of Introduction to the Devout Life This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Nathan Cameron. Introduction to the Devout Life by St. Francis de Sales. Part 2, Chapter 9. Concerning Dryness and Meditation. Should it happen sometimes, my daughter, that you have no taste for or consolation in your meditation, I entreat you not to be troubled, but seek relief in vocal prayer, bemoan yourself to our Lord, confess your unworthiness, implore his aid, kiss his image, if it be beside you, and say in the words of Jacob, I will not let thee go except thou bless me, or with the Canaanitish woman, Yes, Lord, I am as a dog before thee, but the dog eats of the crumbs which fall from their master's tables. Or you can take a book and read attentively till such a time as your mind is calmed and quickened. Or sometimes you may find help from external actions, such as prostrating yourself, folding your hands upon your breast, kissing your crucifix, that is, supposing you are alone. But if, after all this, you are still unrelieved, do not be disturbed by your dryness, however great it be, but continue striving after a devout attitude in God's sight. What numbers of courtiers appear a hundred times at court without any hope of a word from their king, but merely to pay their homage to be seen of him. Just so, my daughter, we ought to enter upon mental prayer purely to fulfill our duty and testify our loyalty. If it pleases God's divine majesty to speak to us and discourse in our hearts by his holy inspirations and inward consolations, it is doubtless a great honor and very sweet to our soul. But if he does not vouchsafe such favors, but makes as though he saw us not, as though we were not in his presence, nevertheless we must not quit it, but on the contrary we must remain calmly and devoutly before him, and he is certain to accept our patient waiting, and give heed to our assiduity and perseverance, so that another time he will impart to us his consolations, and let us taste all the sweetness of holy meditation. But even were it not so, let us, my child, be satisfied with the privilege of being in his presence and seen of him. End of Part 2 Chapter 9 Recorded by Nathan Cameron Part 2, Chapter 10 Of Introduction to the Devout Life This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recorded by Nathan Cameron Introduction to the Devout Life by St. Francis de Sales Part 2, Chapter 10 Morning Prayer Besides your systematic meditation and your other vocal prayers, there are five shorter kinds of prayer, which are as aids and assistance to the great devotion, and foremost among these is your morning prayer. It is a general preparation for all the day's work, and it should be made in this wise. 1. Thank God and adore Him for His grace, which has kept you safely through the night and if in anything you have offended him, ask forgiveness. 2. Call to mind the day now beginning is given to you in order that you may work for eternity, and make a steadfast resolution to use this day for that end. 3. Consider beforehand what occupations, duties, and occasions are likely this day to enable you to serve God, what temptations to offend him, either by vanity, anger, etc., may arise, and make fervent resolution to use all means of serving him and confirming your own piety, as also to avoid and resist whatever might hinder your salvation in God's glory. Nor is it enough to make such a resolution. You must also prepare to carry it into effect. Thus, if you foresee having to meet someone who is hot-tempered and irritable, you must not merely resolve to guard your own temper, but you must consider by what gentle words to conciliate them. If you know you will see some sick person, consider how to best minister comfort to him, and so on. 4. Next, humble yourself before God, confessing that of yourself you could carry out nothing that you had planned, either in avoiding evil or seeking good. Then, so to say, take your heart in your hands and offer it in all your good intentions to God's gracious mercy, 
entreating him to accept them and strengthen you in his service, which you may do in some such words as these. Lord, I lay before thee my weak heart, which thou dost fill with good desires. Thou knowest that I am unable to bring the same to good effect, unless thou dost bless and prosper them. And therefore, O living Father, I entreat of thee to help me by the merits and passions of thy dear Son, to whose honor I would devote this day and my whole life. All these acts should be made briefly and heartily, before you leave your room if possible, so that all of the coming work of the day may be prospered, with God's blessing. But anyhow, my daughter, I entreat you never to omit them. End of Part 2, Chapter 10 Recorded by Nathan Cameron Part 2, Chapter 11 of Introduction to the Devout Life This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Dylan P. Straub Introduction to the Devout Life by St. Francis de Sales Part 2, Chapter 11 Evening Prayer and Examination of Conscience As I have counseled you before your material dinner to make a spiritual repast and meditation, so before your evening meal you should make at least a devout spiritual collation. Make sure of some brief leisure before supper time, and then, prostrating yourself before God and recollecting yourself in the presence of Christ crucified, setting him before your mind with a steadfast inward glance, Renew the warmth of your morning's meditation by some hearty aspirations and humble upliftings of your soul to your blessed Savior, either repeating those points of your meditation which helped you most, or kindling your heart with anything else you will. As to the examination of conscience, which we all should make before going to bed, you know the rules. 1. Thank God for having preserved you through the day past. 2. Examine how you have conducted yourself through the day in order to which recall where and with whom you have been, and what you have done. 3. If you have done anything good, offer thanks to God. If you have done amiss in thought, word, or deed, ask forgiveness of his divine mercy, resolving to confess the fault when opportunity offers, and to be diligent in doing better. 4. Then commend your body and soul, the church, your relations and friends, to God. Ask the saints and angels may keep watch over you, and with God's blessing go to the rest he has appointed for you. Neither this practice nor that of the morning should ever be omitted. By your morning prayer, you open your soul's windows to the sunshine of righteousness, and by your evening devotions, you close them against the shades of hell. End of Part 2, Chapter 11For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dylan P. Straub. Introduction to the Devout Life by St. Francis de Sales. Part 2, Chapter 12. On Spiritual Retirement. This is a matter, dear daughter, to which I am very anxious to win your attention, for in it lies one of the surest means of your spiritual progress. Strive as often as possible through the day to place yourself in God's presence by some one of the methods already suggested. Consider what God does and what you are doing. You will see his eyes ever fixed upon you in love incomparable. O oh my God, you will cry out, why cannot I always be looking upon thee, even as thou lookest on me? Why do I think so little about thee? O oh my soul, thy only resting place is God, and yet how often dost thou wander? The birds have nests in lofty trees, and the stag his refuge in the thick coverts, where he can shelter from the sun's burning heat. And just so, my daughter, our hearts ought daily to choose some resting place, either Mount Calvary, or the Sacred Wounds, or some other spot close to Christ, where they can retire at will to seek rest and refreshment amid toil, and to be, as in a fortress, protected from temptation. Blessed indeed is the soul which can truly say, Thou, Lord, art my refuge, my castle, my stay, my shelter in the storm, and in the heat of the day. Be sure then, my child, that while externally occupied with business and social duties, you frequently retire within the solitude of your own heart. That solitude need not be in any way hindered by the crowds which surround you. They surround your body, not your soul, and your heart remains alone in the sole presence of God. 
This is what David sought after amid his manifold labors. The Psalms are full of such expressions as, Lord, I am ever with thee. The Lord is always at my right hand. I lift up mine eyes to thee, O Lord, who dwellest in the heavens. Mine eyes look unto God. There are few social duties of sufficient importance to prevent an occasional retirement of the heart into this sacred solitude. When St. Catherine of Siena was deprived by her parents of any place or time for prayer and meditation, our Lord inspired her with the thought of making a little interior oratory in her mind, into which she could retire in heart, and so enjoy a holy solitude amid her outward duties. And henceforward, when the world assaulted her, she was able to be indifferent because, so she said, she could retire within her secret oratory and find comfort with her heavenly bridegroom. So she counseled her spiritual daughters to make a retirement within their heart in which to dwell. Do you in like manner let your heart withdraw to such an inward retirement where, apart from all men, you can lay it bare and treat face to face with God, even as David says that he watched like a pelican in the wilderness, or an owl in the desert, or a sparrow, sitting alone upon the housetop. These words have a sense beyond their literal meaning, or King David's habit of retirement for contemplation, and we may find in them three excellent kinds of retreats in which to seek solitude after the Savior's example, who is symbolized as he hung upon Mount Calvary by the pelican of the wilderness, feeding her young ones with her blood. So again, his nativity in a lonely stable might find a foreshadowing in the owl of the desert, bemoaning and lamenting. And in his ascension, he was like the sparrow rising high above the dwellings of men. Thus, in each of these ways, we can make a retreat amid the daily cares of life and its business. When the blessed Elzer, Count of Ariane en Provence, had been long separated from his pious and beloved wife, Delphine, she sent a messenger to inquire after him, and he returned to answer, I am well, dear wife, and if you would seek me, seek me in the wounded side of our dear Lord Jesus. That is my sure dwelling place, and elsewhere you will seek me in vain. Surely he was a true Christian knight who spoke thus. End of part two, chapter 12. Part two, chapter 13 of Introduction to the Devout Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dylan P. Straub. Introduction to the Devout Life by St. Francis de Sales, Part 2, Chapter 13. Aspirations, Ejaculatory Prayer, and Holy Thoughts. We retire with God because we aspire to Him, and we aspire in order to retire with Him, so that aspiration after God and spiritual retreat excite one another, while both spring from the one source of all holy thoughts. Do you then, my daughter, aspire continually to God, by brief, ardent upliftings of the heart? Praise his excellence, invoke his aid, cast yourself in spirit at the foot of his cross, adore his goodness, offer your whole soul a thousand times a day to him, fix your inward gaze upon him, stretch out your hands to be led by him as a little child to its father, clasp him to your breast as a fragrant nosegay, Appraise him and your soul as a standard. In short, kindle by every possible act your love for God, your tender, passionate desire for the heavenly bridegroom of souls. Such is the ejaculatory prayer, as it was so earnestly inculcated by St. Augustine upon the devout proba. And be sure, my daughter, that if you seek such nearness and intimacy with God, your whole soul will imbibe the perfume of his perfections. Neither is this a difficult practice. It may be interwoven with all our duties and occupations, without hindering any, for neither the spiritual retreat of which I have spoken, nor these inward upliftings of the heart, cause more than a very brief distraction, which, so far from being any hindrance, will rather promote whatever you have in hand. When a pilgrim pauses an instant to take a draught of wine, which refreshes his lips and revives his heart, his onward journey is nowise hindered by the brief delay, but rather it is shortened and lightened and he brings it all the sooner to a happy end, pausing but to advance the better. Sundry collections of ejaculatory prayer have been put forth, which are doubtless very useful, but I should advise you not to tie yourself to any formal words, but rather to speak with heart or mouth whatever springs forth from the love within you, which is sure to supply you with all abundance. 
There are certain utterances which have special force, such as the ejaculatory prayers of which the Psalms are so full, and the numerous loving invocations of Jesus, which we find in the Song of Songs. Many hymns, too, may be used with the like intention, provided they are sung attentively. In short, just as those who are full of some earthly, natural love are ever turning in thought to the Beloved One, their hearts overflowing with tenderness and their lips ever ready to praise that beloved object, comforting themselves in absence by letters, carving the treasured name on every tree. So those who love God cannot cease thinking of him, living for him, longing after him, speaking of him, and fain would they grave the holy name of Jesus in the hearts of every living creature they behold. And to such an outpour of love all creation bids us, nothing that he has made but is filled with the praise of God, and as says St. Augustine, everything in the world speaks silently but clearly to the lovers of God of their love, exciting them to holy desires, whence gush forth aspirations and loving cries to God. St. Gregory Nazianzen tells his flock how, walking along the seashore, he watched the waves as they washed up shells and seaweeds and all manner of small substances, which seemed, as it were, rejected by the sea until a return wave would often wash part thereof back again, while the rocks remained firm and immovable, let the waves beat against them never so fiercely. And then the saint went on to reflect that feeble hearts let themselves be carried hither and thither by the varying waves of sorrow, or consolation, as the case might be, like the shells upon the seashore, while those of a nobler mold abide firm and immovable amid every storm. Whence he breaks out into David's cry, Lord, save me, for the waters are gone over my soul. Deliver me from the great deep. All thy waves and storms are gone over me. For he was himself then in trouble by reason of the ungodly usurpation of his see by Maximus. When St. Fulgentius, bishop of Ruspe, heard Theodoric, king of the Goths, harangue a general assembly of Roman nobles and beheld their splendor, he exclaimed, O God, how glorious must thy heavenly Jerusalem be, if even earthly Rome be thus! And if this world can afford so much gratification to merely earthly lovers of vanity, what must there be in store hereafter for those who love the truth? If thus thy lower works are fair, if thus thy glories gild the span of ruined earth and guilty man, how glorious must the mansions be, where thy redeemed dwell with thee! We are told that St. Anselm of Canterbury, our mountains may glory in being his birthplace, was much given to such thoughts. On one occasion a hunted hare took refuge from imminent death beneath the bishop's horse, the hounds clamoring round, but not daring to drag it from its asylum, whereat his attendants began to laugh. But the great Anselm wept, saying, You may laugh, forsooth, but to the poor hunted beast it is no laughing matter. Even so, the soul which has been led astray in all manner of sin finds a host of enemies waiting at its last hour to devour it, and terrified, knows not where to seek a refuge, and if it can find none, its enemies laugh and rejoice. And so he went on his way, sighing. Constantine the Great wrote with great respect to St. Anthony, at which his religious expressed their surprise. Do you marvel, he said, that a king should write to an ordinary man? Marvel rather that God should have written his law for men, and yet more, that he should have spoken with them face to face through his son. When St. Francis saw a solitary sheep amid a flock of goats, See, said he to his companion, how gentle the poor sheep is among the goats, even as was our Lord among the Pharisees. And seeing a boar devour a little lamb, poor little one, he exclaimed, weeping, how vividly is my Saviour's death set forth in thee. A great man of our own day, Francis Borgia, then Duke of Candia, was wont to indulge in many devout imaginations as he was hunting. I used to ponder, he said, how the falcon returns to one's wrist, and lets one hood its eyes, or chain it to the perch, and yet men are so perverse in refusing to turn at God's call. St. Basil the Great says that the rose amid its thorns preaches a lesson to men. All that is pleasant in this life, so it tells us mortals, is mingled with sadness. No joy is altogether pure. All enjoyment is liable to be marred by regrets. Marriage is saddened by widowhood. Children bring anxiety. Glory often turns to shame. Neglect follows upon honor, weariness on pleasure, sickness on health. Truly, the rose is a lovely flower, the saint goes on to say, but it moves me to sadness, reminding me as it does that for my sin the earth was condemned, 
to bring forth thorns. Another devout soul, gazing upon a brook, wherein the starlit sky of a calm summer's night was reflected, exclaims, O my God, when thou callest me to dwell in thy heavenly tabernacles, these stars will be beneath my feet, and even as those stars are now reflected here below, so are we thy creatures reflected above in the living waters of thy divine love. So another cried out, beholding a rapid river as it flowed, Even thus my soul will know no rest until it plunge into that divine sea whence it came forth. St. Francis, as she knelt to pray beside the banks of a pleasant streamlet, cried out in ecstasy, The grace of my dear Lord flows softly and sweetly, even as these refreshing waters. And another saintly soul, looking upon the blooming orchards, cried out, Why am I alone barren in the church's garden? So St. Francis of Assisi, beholding a hen gathering her chickens beneath her wings, exclaimed, Keep me, O Lord, under the shadow of thy wings. And looking upon the sunflower, he ejaculated, When, O Lord, will my soul follow the attractions of thy love? And gathering pansies in a garden which are fair to see, but scentless, Ah, he cried out, Even so are the thoughts of my heart, fair to behold, but without savor or fruit. Thus it is, my daughter, that good thoughts and holy aspirations may be drawn from all that surrounds us in our ordinary life. Woe to them that turn aside the creature from the Creator, and thrice blessed are they who turn all creation to their Creator's glory, and make human vanities subservient to the truth. Verily, says St. Gregory Nazianzen, I am wont to turn all things to my spiritual profit. Read the pious epitaph written for St. Paula by St. Jerome. It is marvelous therein to see how she conceives spiritual thoughts and aspirations at every turn. Now in the practice of this spiritual retreat and of these ejaculatory prayers, the great work of devotion lies. It can supply all other deficiencies, but there is hardly any means of making up where this is lacking. Without it, no one can lead a true contemplative life, and the active life will be but imperfect where it is omitted. Without it, rest is but indolence, labor but weariness. Therefore, I beseech you to adopt it heartily and never let it go. End of part two, chapter 13. Part two, chapter 14 of Introduction to the Devout Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dylan P. Straub. Introduction to the Devout Life by St. Francis de Sales, Part 2, Chapter 14, of Holy Communion, and How to Join in It. 1. So far I have said nothing concerning the sun of all spiritual exercises, even the most holy, sacred, and sovereign sacrifice and sacrament of the Eucharist, the very center point of our Christian religion, the heart of all devotion, the soul of piety, that ineffable mystery which embraces the whole depth of divine love, by which God, giving himself really to us, conveys all his graces and favors to men with royal magnificence. 2. Prayer made in union with this divine sacrifice has untold power, through which, indeed, the soul overflows with heavenly grace, and leaning on her beloved, becomes so filled with spiritual sweetness and perfume, that we may ask, in the words of the canticles, Who is this that cometh out of the wilderness like pillars of smoke, perfumed with myrrh and frankincense, with all powders of the merchant. 3. Strive then to your utmost to be present every day at this holy celebration, in order that, with the priest, you may offer the sacrifice of your Redeemer on behalf of yourself and the whole church to God the Father. St. Chrysostom says that the angels crowd around it in adoration, and if we are found together with them, united in one intention, we cannot but be most favorably influenced by such society. Moreover, all the heavenly choirs of the church triumphant, as well as those of the church militant, are joined to our dear Lord in this divine act, so that with him, in him, and by him, they may win the favor of God the Father and obtain his mercy for us. How great the blessing to my soul to contribute its share towards the attainment of so gracious a gift. For if any imperative hindrance prevents your presence at this sovereign sacrifice of Christ's most true presence, at least be sure to take part in it spiritually. If you cannot go to church, choose some morning hour in which to unite your intention to that of the whole Christian world, 
and make the same interior acts of devotion wherever you are that you would make if you were really present at the celebration of the Holy Eucharist in church. 5. In order to join in this rightly, whether actually or mentally, you must give heed to several things. 1. In the beginning and before the priest goes up to the altar, make your preparation with his, placing yourself in God's presence, confessing your unworthiness, and asking forgiveness. 2. Until the gospel, dwell simply and generally upon the coming and the life of our Lord in this world. 3. From the gospel to the end of the creed, dwell upon our dear Lord's teaching, and renew your resolution to live and die in the faith of the Holy Catholic Church. 4. From thence, fix your heart on the mysteries of the word, and unite yourself to the death and passion of our Redeemer, now actually and essentially set forth in this holy sacrifice, which, together with the priest and all the congregation, you offer to God the Father, to his glory, and your own salvation. 5. Up to the moment of communicating, offer all the longings and desires of your heart, above all desiring most earnestly to be united forever to our Savior by his eternal love. 6. From the time of communion to the end, thank his gracious majesty for his incarnation, his life, death, passion, and the love which he sets forth in this holy sacrifice, entreating through it his favor for yourself, your relations and friends, and the whole church, and humbling yourself sincerely, devoutly receive the blessing which our dear Lord gives you through the channel of his minister. If, however, you wish to follow your daily course of meditation on special mysteries during the sacrifice, it is not necessary that you should interrupt yourself by making these several acts, but it will suffice that at the beginning you dispose your intention to worship and to offer the holy sacrifice in your meditation and prayer, since every meditation includes all the above-named acts, either explicitly or implicitly. End of Part 2, Chapter 14Part 2, Chapter 15 of Introduction to the Devout Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dylan P. Straub. Introduction to the Devout Life by St. Francis de Sales. Part 2, Chapter 15 of the Other Public Offices of the Church. Furthermore, my daughter, you should endeavor to assist at the offices, hours, vespers, etc., as far as you are able, especially on Sundays and festivals, days which are dedicated to God, wherein we ought to strive to do more for his honor and glory than on others. You will greatly increase the fervor of your devotion by so doing, even as did St. Augustine, who tells us in his confessions that in the early days of his conversion he was touched to the quick and his heart overflowed in happy tears when he took part in the offices of the church. Moreover, let me say it here once for all, there is always more profit and more consolation in the public offices of the church than in private acts of devotion, God having willed to give the preference to communion and prayer over all individual action. Be ready to take part in any confraternities and associations you may find in the place where you are called to dwell, especially such as are most fruitful and edifying. This will be pleasing to God, for although confraternities are not ordained, they are recommended by the church, which grants various privileges to those who are united thereby. And it is always a work of love to join with others and take part in their good works. And although it may be possible that you can use equally profitable devotions by yourself as in common with others, perhaps even you may like doing so best, nevertheless, God is more glorified when we unite with our brethren and neighbors and join our offerings to theirs. I say the same concerning all public services and prayers, in which, as far as possible, each one of us is bound to contribute the best example we can for our neighbor's edification and our hearty desire for God's glory and the general good of all men. End of Part 2, Chapter 15 Part 2, Chapter 16 of Introduction to the Devout Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dylan P. Straub. Introduction to the Devout Life by St. Francis de Sales. Part 2, Chapter 16. How the Saints are United to Us. Inasmuch as God continually sends us inspirations by means of his angels, we may fitly send back our aspirations through the same channel. The souls of the holy dead, resting in paradise, 
who are, as our Lord himself has told us, as the angels in heaven, are also united to us in their prayers. My child, let us gladly join our hearts with these heavenly blessed ones, for even as the newly fledged nightingale learns to sing from the elder birds, so by our sacred communing with the saints we shall learn better to pray and sing the praises of the Lord. David is continually uniting his prayers with those of all the saints and angels. Honor, revere, and respect the Blessed Virgin Mary with a very special love. She is the mother of our Sovereign Lord, and so we are her children. Let us think of her with all the love and confidence of affectionate children. Let us desire her love and strive with true filial hearts to imitate her graces. Seek to be familiar with the angels. Learn to realize that they are continually present, although invisible. Specially love and revere the guardian angel of the diocese in which you live. Those are the friends who surround you and your own. Commune with them frequently. Join in their songs of praise and seek their protection and help in all you do, spiritual or temporal. That pious man, Peter Faber, the first companion of St. Ignatius, and the first priest, first preacher, and first theological teacher of the company of the Jesuits, who was a native of our diocese, once passing through this country on his way from Germany, where he had been laboring for God's glory, told how great comfort he had found as he went among places infested with heresy in communing with the guardian angels thereof, whose help had often preserved him from danger and softened hearts to receive the faith. He spoke with such earnestness that a lady who, when quite young, heard him, was so impressed that she repeated his words to me only four years ago, sixty years after their utterance, with the utmost feeling. I had the happiness, only last year, of consecrating an altar in the place where it pleased God to give that blessed man birth, the little village of Villa Rey, amid the wildest of our mountains. You will do well to choose out for yourself some individual saint whose life specially to study and imitate and whose prayers may be more particularly offered on your behalf. The saint bearing your own baptismal name would seem to be naturally assigned to you. End of part two, chapter 16. Part two, chapter 17 of Introduction to the Devout Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dylan P. Straub. Introduction to the Devout Life by St. Francis de Sales. Part 2, Chapter 17. How to Hear and Read God's Word. Cultivate a special devotion to God's Word, whether studied privately or in public. Always listen to it with attention and reverence. Strive to profit by it, and do not let it fall to the ground, but receive it within your heart as a precious balm thereby imitating the Blessed Virgin, who kept all these sayings in her heart. Remember that our Lord receives our words of prayer according to the way in which we receive his words in teaching. You should always have some good devout book at hand, such as the writings of St. Bonaventura, Gerson, Dennis the Carthusian, Blogius, Granada, Stella, Arius, Penella, De Ponte, Avila, the Spiritual Combat, The Confessions of St. Augustine, St. Jerome's Epistles, or the like, and daily read some small portion attentively, as though you are reading letters sent by the saints from paradise to teach you the way thither, and encourage you to follow them. Read the lives of the saints, too, which are as a mirror to you of Christian life, and try to imitate their actions according to your circumstances. For although many things which the saints did may not be practicable for those who live in the world, they may be followed more or less. Thus, in our spiritual retreats, we imitate the solitude of the first hermit, St. Paul. In the practice of poverty, we imitate St. Francis, and so on. Of course, some lives throw much more light upon our daily course than others, such as the life of St. Teresa, which is most admirable. The first Jesuits, St. Charles Borromeo, Archbishop of Milan, St. Louis, St. Bernard, St. Francis, and such like. Others are more the subjects of our admiring wonder than of imitation, such as St. Mary of Egypt, St. Simeon Stylites, St. Catherine of Genoa, and St. Catherine of Siena, St. Angela, etc., though these should tend to kindle a great love of God in our hearts. End of Part 2, Chapter 17 Part 2, Chapter 18 of Introduction to the Devout Life This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dylan P. Straub. Introduction to the Devout Life by St. Francis de Sales. Part 2, Chapter 18, How to Receive Inspirations. By inspirations, I mean all drawings, feelings, interior reproaches, lights, and intuitions with which God moves us, preventing our hearts by his fatherly love and care, and awakening, exciting, urging, and attracting them to goodness, to heavenly love, to good resolutions, in short, to whatever tends to our eternal welfare. This it is of which we read in the canticles, when the bridegroom knocks at the door, awakens his beloved, calls upon her, seeks her, bids her eat of his honey, gather the fruit and flowers of his garden, and let him hear her voice, which is sweet to him. Let me make use of an illustration of my meaning. In contracting a marriage, the bride must be a party to three separate acts. First, the bridegroom is proposed to her. Secondly, she entertains the proposal. And thirdly, she gives her consent. Just so, when God intends to perform some act of love in us, by us, and with us, he first suggests it by his inspiration. Secondly, we receive that inspiration. And thirdly, we consent to it. For, like as we fall into sin by three steps, temptation, delectation, and consent, so there are three steps whereby we ascend to virtue, inspiration as opposed to temptation, delectation and God's inspiration as opposed to that of temptation, and consent to the one instead of to the other. Were God's inspirations to last all our lives, we should be no wise more acceptable to him unless we took pleasure therein. On the contrary, we should rather offend him as did the Israelites, of whom he says that they grieved him for forty years long, refusing to hear his pleadings, so that at last I swear in my wrath that they should not enter into my rest. And to recur to my first illustration, one who has long been devoted to his lady love would feel greatly injured if, after all, she would not consent to the alliance he seeks. The delight we take in God's inspirations is an important step gained towards his glory, and we begin at once to please him thereby, for although such delectation is not the same thing as a full consent, it shows a strong tendency thereto. And if it is a good and profitable sign when we take pleasure in hearing God's word, which is, so to say, an external inspiration, still more is it good and acceptable in his sight when we take delight in his interior inspirations. Such is the delight of which the bride says, My soul melted within me when my beloved spake. And so too the earthly lover is well satisfied when he sees that his lady love finds pleasure in his attentions. But, after all, consent only perfects the good action. For if we are inspired of God, and take pleasure in that inspiration, and yet, nevertheless, refuse our consent to his inspiration, we are acting a very contemptuous, offensive part towards him. We read of the bride that, although the voice of her beloved touched her heart, she made trivial excuses, and delayed opening the door to him, and so he withdrew himself and was gone. And the earthly lover, who had long sought a lady and seemed acceptable to her, would have the more ground for complaint if at last he was spurned and dismissed, than if he had never been favorably received. Do you, my daughter, resolve to accept whatever inspirations God may vouchsafe you, heartily, and when they offer themselves, receive them as the ambassadors of your heavenly king, seeking alliance with you. Hearken gently to their propositions. Foster the love with which you are inspired, and cherish the holy guest. Give your consent, and let it be a full, loving, steadfast consent to his holy inspirations. For so doing, God will reckon your affection as a favor, although truly we can confer none upon him. But before consenting to inspirations which have respect to important or extraordinary things, guard against self-deception by consulting your spiritual guide, and let him examine whether the inspiration be real or no, and that the rather because when the enemy sees us all ready to hearken to inspirations, he is wont to set false delusions in the way to deceive it, a snare you will not fall into so long as you humbly obey your guide. Consent once given, you must carefully seek to produce the intended results and carry out the inspiration, the crown of true virtue. For to give consent without producing the result thereof were like planting a vine without meaning it to bear fruit. 
All this will be greatly promoted by careful attention to your morning exercises and the spiritual retirement already mentioned, because therein you learn to carry general principles to a special application. End of Part 2, Chapter 18《Part 2 Chapter 19 of Introduction to the Devout Life》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dylan P. Straub — Introduction to the Devout Life by St. Francis de Sales — Part 2 Chapter 19 — On Confession Our Savior has bequeathed the sacrament of penitence and confession to His Church in order that therein we may be cleansed from all our sins, however and whenever we may have been soiled thereby. Therefore, my child, never allow your heart to abide heavy with sin, seeing that there is so sure and safe a remedy at hand. If the lioness has been in the neighborhood of other beasts, she hastens to wash away their scent, lest it should be displeasing to her lord. And so the soul which has ever so little consented to sin ought to abhor itself and make haste to seek purification, out of respect to his divine gaze who beholds it always. Why should we die a spiritual death when there is a sovereign remedy available? Make your confession humbly and devoutly every week, and always, if you can, before communicating, even although your conscience is not burdened with mortal sin, for in confession you do not only receive absolution for your venial sins, but you also receive great strength to help you in avoiding them henceforth, clearer light to discover your failings, and abundant grace to make up whatever loss you have incurred through those faults. You exercise the graces of humility, obedience, simplicity, and love, and by this one act of confession, you practice more virtue than in any other. Be sure always to entertain a hearty sorrow for the sins you confess, however small they are, as also a steadfast resolution to correct them in future. Some people go on confessing venial sins out of mere habit, and conventionally, without making any effort to correct them, thereby losing a great deal of the spiritual good. Supposing that you confess having said something untrue, although without evil consequences, or some careless words or excessive amusement, repent, and make a firm resolution of amendment. It is a mere abuse to confess any sin whatever, be it mortal or venial, without intending to put it altogether away, that being the express object of confession. Beware of unmeaning self-accusations, made out of a mere routine, such as, I have not loved God as much as I ought, I have not prayed with as much devotion as I ought, I have not loved my neighbor as I ought, I have not received the sacraments with sufficient reverence, and the like. Such things as these are altogether useless in setting the state of your conscience before your confessor, inasmuch as all the saints in paradise and all men living would say the same. But examine closely what special reason you have for accusing yourself thus. And when you have discovered it, accuse yourself simply and plainly of your fault. For instance, when confessing that you have not loved your neighbor as you ought, it may be that what you mean is that having seen someone in great want, whom you could have succored, you have failed to do so. Well then, accuse yourself of that special omission. Say, having come across a person in need, I did not help him as I might have done either through negligence or hardness or indifference, according as the case may be. So again, do not accuse yourself of not having prayed to God with sufficient devotion. But if you have given way to voluntary distractions, or if you have neglected the proper circumstances of devout prayer, whether place, time, or attitude, say so plainly, just as it is, and do not deal in generalities which, so to say, blow neither hot nor cold." Again, do not be satisfied with mentioning the bare fact of your venial sins, but accuse yourself of the motive cause which led to them. For instance, do not be content with saying that you told an untruth which injured no one, but say whether it was out of vanity, in order to win praise or avoid blame, out of heedlessness or from obstinacy. If you have exceeded in society, say whether it was from the love of talking or gambling for the sake of money, and so on. Say whether you continued long to commit the fault in question, as the importance of a fault depends greatly upon its continuance, e.g., there is a wide difference between a passing act of vanity, which is over in a quarter of an hour, and one which fills the heart for one or more days. So you must mention the fact, the motive, and the duration of your faults. 
It is true that we are not bound to be so precise in confessing venial sins, or even, technically speaking, to confess them at all. But all who aim at purifying their souls in order to attain a really devout life will be careful to show all their spiritual maladies, however slight, to their spiritual physician, in order to be healed. Do not spare yourself in telling whatever is necessary to explain the nature of your fault as, for instance, the reason why you lost your temper, or why you encouraged another in wrongdoing. Thus, someone whom I dislike says a chance word in joke. I take it ill and put myself in a passion. If one I like had said a stronger thing, I should not have taken it amiss. So, in confession, I ought to say that I lost my temper with a person, not because of the words spoken so much as because I disliked the speaker. And if, in order to explain yourself clearly, it is necessary to particularize the words, it is well to do so. Because accusing oneself thus simply, one discovers not merely one's actual sins, but one's bad habits, inclinations, and ways, and the other roots of sin, by which means one's spiritual father acquires a fuller knowledge of the heart he is dealing with, and knows better what remedies to apply. But you must always avoid exposing anyone who has borne any part in your sin as far as possible. Keep watch over a variety of sins, which are apt to spring up and flourish, often insensibly in the conscience, so that you may confess them and put them away. And with this view, read chapters 6, 27, 28, 29, 35, and 36 of part 3, and chapter 7 of part 4, attentively. Do not lightly change your confessor, but having chosen him, be regular in giving account of your conscience to him at the appointed seasons, telling him your faults simply and frankly, and from time to time, say, every month or every two months, show him the general state of your inclinations, although there be nothing wrong in them, as, for instance, whether you are depressed and anxious or cheerful, desirous of advancement or money and the like. End of part two, chapter 19. Part 2, Chapter 20 of Introduction to the Devout Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dylan P. Straub. Introduction to the Devout Life by St. Francis to Sales. Part 2, Chapter 20 of Frequent Communion. It is said that Mithridates, king of Pontus, who invented the poison called after him, Mithridate, so thoroughly impregnated his system with it that when eventually he tried to poison himself to avoid becoming the Roman slave, he never could succeed. The Savior instituted the most holy sacrament of the Eucharist, really containing his body and blood, in order that they who eat it might live forever, and therefore Whosoever receives it frequently and devoutly so strengthens the health and life of his soul that it is hardly possible for him to be poisoned by any evil desires. We cannot be fed by that living flesh and hold to the affections of death. And just as our first parents could not die in paradise because of the tree of life which God had placed therein, so this sacrament of life makes spiritual death impossible. The most fragile, easily spoilt fruits, such as cherries, apricots, and strawberries, can be kept all the year by being preserved in sugar or honey. So what wonder if our hearts, frail and weakly as they are, are kept from the corruption of sin when they are preserved in the sweetness, sweeter than honey in the honeycomb, of the incorruptible body and blood of the Son of God? O oh, my daughter, those Christians who are lost will indeed have no answer to give when the just judge sets before them that they have voluntarily died the spiritual death, since it was so easy for them to have preserved life and health by eating his body, which he gave them for that very end. Miserable men, he will say, wherefore would ye die with the bread of life itself in your hands? As to daily communion, I neither commend nor condemn it, but with respect to communicating every Sunday, I counsel and exhort every one to do so, providing the mind has no attachment to sin. So says St. Augustine, and with him I find neither fault nor unconditionally commend daily communion, leaving that matter to the discretion of every person's own spiritual guide, as the requisite dispositions for such frequent communion are too delicate for one to advise it indiscriminately. 
On the other hand, these very special dispositions may be found in sundry devout souls, and therefore it would not be well to discourage everybody. It is a subject which must be dealt with according to each individual mind. It were imprudent to advise such frequent communion to all, while, on the other hand, it would be presumptuous to blame any one for it, especially if he therein follows the advice of some wise director. St. Catherine of Siena, when blamed for her frequent communions, under the plea that St. Augustine neither commended nor condemned daily communion, replied gently, Well then, since St. Augustine does not condemn it, neither, I pray you, do you condemn it, and I shall be content. But St. Augustine earnestly exhorts all to communicate every Sunday, and as I presume, my daughter, that you have no attachment either to mortal or venial sins, you are in the condition which St. Augustine requires, and if your spiritual father approves, you may profitably communicate more frequently. Nevertheless, there are various hindrances which may arise, not so much from yourself as from those among whom you live, which may lead a wise director to tell you not to communicate so often. For instance, if you are in a position of subjection, and those whom you are bound to obey should be so ignorant or so prejudiced as to be uneasy at your frequent communions, all things considered, it may be well to show consideration for their weakness, and to make your communion fortnightly, only, of course, when there is no possible way of overcoming the difficulty otherwise. But one cannot give any general rule on such a point. Each person must follow the advice of their own spiritual guide. Only this much I will say, that monthly communions are the very fewest which anyone seeking to serve God devoutly can make. If you are discreet, neither father nor mother, husband nor wife will ever hinder you from communicating frequently, and that because on the day of your communion you will give good heed always to be more than usually gentle and amiable towards them, doing all you can to please them, so that they are not likely to prevent your doing a thing which in no wise inconveniences themselves, unless they were most particularly unreasonable and perverse, in which case, as I have said, your director might advise you to yield. There is nothing in the married life to hinder frequent communion. Most certainly the Christians of the primitive church communicated daily, whether married or single. Neither is any malady a necessary impediment, except, indeed, anything producing constant sickness. Those who communicate weekly must be free from mortal sin, and also from any attachment to venial sin, and they should feel a great desire for communion. But for daily communion, people should furthermore have conquered most of their inclinations to evil, and no one should practice it without the advice of their spiritual guide. End of Part 2, Chapter 20. Part 2, Chapter 21 of Introduction to the Devout Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dylan P. Straub. Introduction to the Devout Life by St. Francis de Sales. Part 2, Chapter 21. How to Communicate. Begin your preparation overnight by sundry aspirations and loving ejaculations. Go to bed somewhat earlier than usual, so that you may get up earlier the next morning. And if you should wake during the night... Fill your heart and lips at once with sacred words wherewith to make your soul ready to receive the bridegroom, who watches while you sleep, and who intends to give you countless gifts and graces, if you on your part are prepared to accept them. In the morning rise, with joyful expectation of the blessing you hope for, and, having made your confession, go with the fullest trust, but at the same time with the fullest humility, to receive that heavenly food which will sustain your immortal life. And after having said the sacred words, Lord, I am not worthy, do not make any further movement whatever, either in prayer or otherwise, but gently opening your mouth in the fullness of faith, hope, and love, receive him in whom, by whom, and through whom you believe, hope, and love. O oh, my child, bethink you that just as the bee, having gathered heaven's dew and earth's sweetest juices from amid the flowers, carries it to her hive, so the priest, having taken the Savior, God's own Son, who came down from heaven, the Son of Mary, who sprang up as earth's choicest flower from the altar, feeds you with that bread of sweetness and of all delight. When you have received it, kindle your heart to adore the King of our salvation. 
Tell him of all your own personal matters, and realize that he is within you, seeking your best happiness. In short, give him the very best reception you possibly can, and act so that in all you do it may be evident that God is with you. When you cannot have the blessing of actual communion, at least communicate in heart and mind, uniting yourself by ardent desire to the life-giving body of the Savior. Your main intention in communion should be to grow, strengthen, and abound in the love of God. For love's sake, receive that which love alone gives you. Of a truth, there is no more loving or tender aspect in which to gaze upon the Savior than this act, in which he, so to say, annihilates himself and gives himself to us as food, in order to fill our souls and to unite himself more closely to the heart and flesh of his faithful ones. If men of the world ask where you communicate so often, tell them that it is that you may learn to love God, that you may be cleansed from imperfections, set free from trouble, comforted in affliction, strengthened in weakness. Tell them that there are two manner of men who need frequent communion, those who are perfect, since being ready they were much to blame did they not come to the source and fountain of all perfection, and the imperfect, that they may learn how to become perfect. The strong, lest they become weak, and the weak, that they may become strong. The sick, that they may be healed, and the sound, lest they sicken. Tell them that you, imperfect, weak, and ailing, need frequently to communicate with your perfection, your strength, your physician. Tell them that those who are but little engaged in worldly affairs should communicate often, because they have leisure, and those who are heavily pressed with business, because they stand so much in need of help and he who is hard-worked needs frequent and substantial food. Tell them that you receive the blessed sacrament that you may learn to receive it better. One rarely does that well, which one seldom does. Therefore, my child, communicate frequently, as often as you can, subject to the advice of your spiritual father. Our mountain hares turn white in winter because they live in and feed upon the snow. And by dint of adoring and feeding upon beauty, goodness, and purity itself in this most divine sacrament, you too will become lovely, holy, and pure. End of part two, chapter 21. Part three, chapter one of Introduction to the Devout Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Danielle Hetzel Introduction to the Devout Life by St. Francis de Sales Part 3, Chapter 1 How to Select That Which We Should Chiefly Practice The queen bee never takes wings without being surrounded by all her subjects. Even so, love never enters the heart, but it is sure to bring all other virtues in its train, marshalling and employing them as a captain his soldiers. Yet, nevertheless, Love does not set them all to work suddenly or equally at all times and everywhere. The righteous man is, like a tree planted by the waterside, that will bring forth his fruit in due season. Inasmuch as love, watering and refreshing the soul, causes it to bring forth good works, each in season as required. There is an old proverb to the effect that the sweetest music is unwelcome at a time of mourning and certain persons have made a great mistake when, seeking to cultivate some special virtue, they attempt to obtrude it on all occasions, like the ancient philosophers we read of, who were always laughing or weeping. Worse still, if they take upon themselves to censure those who do not make a continual study of this their pet virtue. St. Paul tells us to rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep and charity is patient, kind, liberal, prudent, indulgent. At the same time, there are virtues of universal account, which must not only be called into occasional action, but ought to spread their influence over everything. We do not very often come across opportunities for exercising strength, magnanimity, or magnificence. But gentleness, temperance, modesty, and humility are graces which ought to color everything we do. There may be virtues of a more exalted mold, but at all events these are the most continually called for in daily life. 
Sugar is better than salt, but we use salt more generally and oftener. Consequently, it is well to have a good and ready stock in hand of those general virtues of which we stand in so perpetual a need. In practicing any virtue, it is well to choose that which is most according to our duty rather than most according to our taste. It was St. Paula's liking to practice bodily mortifications with a view to the keener enjoyment of spiritual sweetness. But obedience to her superiors was a higher duty. And therefore, St. Jerome acknowledges that she was wrong in practicing excessive abstinence contrary to the advice of her bishop. In the Apostles, whose mission it was to preach the gospel and feed souls with the bread of life, judged well that it was not right for them to hinder this holy work in order to minister to the material wants of the poor, weighty as that work was also. Every calling stands in special need of some special virtue. Those required of a prelate, a prince, or a soldier are quite different. So are those beseeming a wife or a widow, and although all should possess every virtue, yet all are not called upon to exercise them equally but each should cultivate chiefly those which are important to the manner of life which he is called. Among such virtues as have no special adaptation to our own calling, choose the most excellent, not the most showy. A comet generally looks larger than the stars and fills the eye more, but all the while comets are not nearly so important as the stars, and only seem so large to us because they are nearer to us than stars and are of a grosser kind. So there are certain virtues which touch us very sensibly and are very material, so to say, and therefore ordinary people give them the preference. Thus the common run of men ordinarily value temporal almsgiving more than spiritual, and think more of fasting, exterior discipline, and bodily mortifications than of meekness, cheerfulness, modesty, and other interior mortifications, which nevertheless are far better. Do you then, my daughter, choose the best virtues, not those which are most highly esteemed, the most excellent, not the most divisible, the truest, not the most conspicuous? It is well for everybody to select some special virtue at which to aim, not as neglecting any others, but as an object and pursuit to the mind. St. John, Bishop of Alexandria, saw a vision of a lovely maiden, brighter than the sun, in shining garments and wearing an olive crown, who said to him, I am the king's eldest daughter, and if thou wilt have me for thy friend, I will bring thee to see his face. Then he knew that it was pity for the poor which God thus commended to him, and from that time he gave himself so heartily to practice it that he is universally known as St. John the Almoner. Eulogius Alexandrinus desired to devote himself wholly to God, but he had not the courage either to adopt the solitary life or to put himself under obedience, and therefore he took a miserable beggar, seething in dirt and leprosy, to live with him, and to do this more thoroughly he vowed to honor and serve him as a servant does his lord and master. After a while, both feeling greatly tempted to part company, they referred to the great St. Anthony, who said, Beware of separating my sons, for you are both near your end, and if the angel find you not together, you will be in danger of losing your crowns. St. Louis counted it a privilege to visit the hospitals, where he used to tend the sick with his own royal hands. St. Francis loved poverty above all things and called her his lady love. St. Dominic gave himself up to preaching, whence his order takes its name. St. Gregory the Great specially delighted to receive pilgrims after the manner of faithful Abraham, and like him entertained the king of glory under a pilgrim's garb. Tobit devoted himself to the charitable work of burying the dead. St. Elizabeth, albeit a mighty princess, loved above all things to humble herself. When St. Catherine of Genoa became a widow, she gave herself up to work in a hospital. Cassian relates how a certain devout maiden once besought St. Athanasius to help her in cultivating the grace of patience, and he gave her a poor widow as companion, who was cross, irritable, and altogether intolerable, 
and whose perpetual fretfulness gave the pious lady abundant opportunity of practicing gentleness and patience. And so some of God's servants devote themselves to nursing the sick, helping the poor, teaching little children in the faith, reclaiming the fallen, building churches, and adorning the altar, making peace among men. Therein they resemble embroideresses who work all manner of silks, gold and silver, on various grounds, so producing beautiful flowers. Just so the pious souls who undertake some special devout practice use it as the ground of their spiritual embroidery and frame all manner of other graces upon it, ordering their actions and affections better by means of this their chief thread which runs through all. Upon thy right hand did stand the queen in a vestiture of gold wrought about with diverse colors. When we are beset by any particular vice, it is well as far as possible to make the opposite virtue our special aim and turn everything to that account. So doing, we shall overcome our enemy and meanwhile make progress in all virtue. Thus, if I am beset with pride or anger, I must above all else strive to cultivate humility and gentleness, and I must turn all my religious exercises, prayer, sacraments, prudence, constancy, moderation, to the same object. The wild boar sharpens its tusks by grinding them against its other teeth, which by the same process are sharpened and pointed. And so, when a good man endeavors to perfect himself in some virtue which he is conscious of specially needing, he ought to give it edge and point by the aid of other virtues, which will themselves be confirmed and strengthened as he uses them with that object. It was so with Job, who, while specially exercising the virtue of patience amid the numberless temptations which beset him, was confirmed in all manner of holiness and godly virtues. And St. Gregory Naziazin says, that sometimes a person has attained the height of goodness by one single act of virtue performed with the greatest perfection, instancing Rahab as an example, who, having practiced the virtue of hospitality very excellently, reached a high point of glory. Of course, any such action must needs be performed with a very exceeding degree of fervor and charity. End of Part 3, Chapter 1part 3 chapter 2 of introduction to the devout life this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by danielle hetzel introduction to the devout life by st francis de sales part 3 chapter 2 the same subject continued St. Augustine says very admirably that beginners in devotion are wont to commit certain faults which, while they are blamable according to the strict laws of perfection, are yet praiseworthy by reason of the promise they hold forth of a future excellent goodness to which they actually tend. For instance, that common shrinking fear which gives rise to an excessive scrupulosity in the souls of some who are but just set free from a course of sin is commendable at that early stage and is the almost certain forerunner of future purity of conscience. But the same fear would be blamable in those who are farther advanced because love should reign in their hearts and love is sure to drive away all such servile fear by degrees. In his early days, St. Bernard was very severe and harsh towards those whom he directed, telling them, to begin with, that they must put aside the body and come to him with their minds only. In confession, he treated all faults, however small, with extreme severity, and his poor apprentices in the study of perfection were so urged onwards that by dint of pressing he kept them back for they lost heart and breath when they found themselves thus driven up so steep and high an ascent. Therein, my daughter, you can see that, although it was his ardent zeal for the most perfect purity which led that great saint so to act, and although such zeal is a great virtue, still it was a virtue that required checking. 
And so God himself checked it in a vision by which he filled St. Bernard with so gentle, tender, and a loving spirit that he was altogether changed, blaming himself heavily for having been so strict and so severe and becoming so kindly and indulgent that he made himself all things to all men in order to win all. St. Jerome tells us that his beloved daughter, St. Paula, was not only extreme, but obstinate in practicing bodily mortifications, and refusing to yield to the advice given her upon that head by her bishop, St. Epiphanius, and furthermore, she gave way so excessively to her grief at the death of those she loved as to peril her own life. Whereupon St. Jerome says, It will be said that I am accusing this saintly woman rather than praising her. But I affirm before Jesus, whom she served and whom I seek to serve, that I am not saying what is untrue on one side or the other, but simply describing her as one Christian another. That is to say, I am writing her history, not her panegyric, and her faults are the virtues of others. He means to say that the defects and faults of St. Paula would have been looked upon as virtues in a less perfect soul. And indeed, there are actions which we must count as imperfections in the perfect, which yet would be highly esteemed in the imperfect. When at the end of a sickness the invalid's legs swell, it is a good sign, indicating that natural strength is returning and throwing off foul humors. But it would be a bad sign in one not avowedly sick, as showing that nature was too feeble to disperse or absorb those humors. So, my child, we must think well of those whom we see practicing virtues, although imperfectly, since the saints have done the like. But as to ourselves, we must give heed to practice them, not only diligently, but discreetly. And to this end, we shall do well strictly to follow the wise man's counsel, and not trust in our own wisdom, but lean on those whom God has given as our guides. And here I must say a few words concerning certain things which some reckon as virtues, although they are nothing of the sort. I mean ecstasies, trances, rhapsodies, extraordinary transformations and the like, which are dwelt on in some books, and which promise to raise the soul to a purely intellectual contemplation, an altogether supernatural mental altitude, and a life of preeminent excellence. But I would have you see, my child, that these perfections are not virtues. They are rather rewards which God gives to virtues, or perhaps, more correctly speaking, tokens of the joys of everlasting life, occasionally granted to men in order to kindle in them a desire for the fullness of joy which is only to be found in paradise. But we must not aspire to such graces, which are in no wise necessary to us in order to love and serve God our only lawful ambition. Indeed, for the most part, these graces are not to be acquired by labor or industry, and that because they are rather passions than actions, which we may receive but cannot create. Moreover, our business only is to become good, devout people, pious men and women, and all our efforts must be to that end. If it should please God further to endow us with angelic perfection, we should then be prepared to become good angels. But meanwhile, let us practice in all simplicity, humility, and devotion those lowly virtues to the attainment of which our Lord has bidden us labor. I mean patience, cheerfulness, self-mortification, humility, obedience, poverty, chastity, kindness to our neighbor, forbearance towards his failings, diligence, and a holy fervor. Let us willingly resign the higher eminences to lofty souls. We are not worthy to take so high a rank in God's service. Let us be content to be as scullions, porters, insignificant attendants in his household, leaving it to him if he should hereafter see fit to call us to his own council chamber. Of a truth, my child, the King of Glory does not reward his servants according to the dignity of their office, 
but according to the humility and love with which they have exercised it. While Saul was seeking his father's asses, he found the kingdom of Israel. Rebekah, watering Abraham's camels, became his son's wife. Ruth, gleaning after Boaz's reapers and lying down at his feet, was raised up to become his bride. Those who pretend to such great and extraordinary graces are very liable to delusions and mistakes, so that sometimes it turns out that people who aspire to be angels are not ordinarily good men, and that their goodness lies more in high-flown words than in heart and deed but we must be aware of despising or presumptuously condemning anything. Only, while thanking God for the preeminence of others, let us abide contentedly in our own lower but safer path, a path of less distinction but more suitable to our lowliness, resting satisfied that if we walk steadily and faithfully therein, God will lift us up to greater things. End of Part 3 Chapter 2 Part 3, Chapter 3 Introduction to the Devout Life This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lisa Feltis Introduction to the Devout Life by St. Francis de Sales Part 3, Chapter 3 On Patience Ye have need of patience, that, after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise, says St. Paul. And the Saviour said, In your patience possess ye your souls. The greatest happiness of any one is to possess his soul, and the more perfect our patience, the more fully we do possess our souls. Call often to mind that our Saviour redeemed us by bearing and suffering, and in like manner we must seek our own salvation amid sufferings and afflictions, bearing insults, contradictions, and troubles with all the gentleness we can possibly command. Do not limit your patience to this or that kind of trial, but extend it universally to whatever God may send or allow to befall you. Some people will only bear patiently with trials which carry their own salve of dignity, such as being wounded in battle, becoming a prisoner of war, being ill-used for the sake of their religion, being impoverished by some strife out of which they came triumphant. Now these persons do not love tribulation, but only the honor which attends it. A really patient servant of God is as ready to bear inglorious troubles as those which are honorable. A brave man can easily bear with contempt, slander, and false accusation from an evil world. But to bear such injustice at the hands of good men, of friends, and relations, is a great test of patience. I have a greater respect for the gentleness with which the great S. Charles Borromeo long endured the public reproaches which a celebrated preacher of a reformed order used to pour out upon him, than for all the other attacks he bore with. For just as the sting of a bee hurts far more than that of a fly, so the injuries or contradictions we endure from good people are much harder to bear than any others. But it is a thing which very often happens, and sometimes too worthy men, who are both highly well-intentioned after their own fashion, annoy and even persecute one another grievously. Be patient, not only with respect to the main trials which beset you, but also under the accidental and accessory annoyances which arise out of them. We often find people who imagine themselves ready to accept a trial in itself, who are impatient of its consequences. We hear one man say, I should not mind poverty, were it not that I am unable to bring up my children and receive my friends as handsomely as I desire. And another says, I should not mind, were it not that the world will suppose it is my own fault. While another would patiently bear to be the subject of slander, provided nobody believed it. 
Others, again, accept one side of a trouble, but fret against the rest, as, for instance, believing themselves to be patient under sickness, only fretting against their inability to obtain the best advice, or at the inconvenience they are to their friends. But, dear child, be sure that we must patiently accept, not sickness only, but such sickness as God chooses to send, in the place, among the people, and subject to the circumstances which He ordains, and so with all other troubles. If any trouble comes upon you, use the remedies with which God supplies you. Not to do this is to tempt Him, but having done so, wait whatever result He wills with perfect resignation. If He pleases to let the evil be remedied, thank Him humbly. But if it be His will that the evil grow greater than the remedies, patiently bless His holy name. Follow St. Gregory's advice. When you are justly blamed for some fault you have committed, humble yourself deeply, and confess that you deserve the blame. If the accusation be false, defend yourself quietly, denying the fact. This is but due respect for truth and your neighbor's edification. But if, after you have made your true and legitimate defense, you are still accused, do not be troubled, and do not try to press your defense. You have had due respect for truth. Have the same now for humility. By acting thus, you will not infringe either a due care for your good name or the affection you are bound to entertain for peace, humility, and gentleness of heart. Complain as little as possible of your wrongs, for as a general rule you may be sure that complaining is sin. But rather that self-love always magnifies our injuries. Above all, do not complain to people who are easily angered and excited. If it is needful to complain to someone, either as seeking a remedy for your injury or in order to soothe your mind, let it be to some calm, gentle spirit, greatly filled with the love of God, for otherwise, instead of relieving your heart, your confidence will only provoke it to still greater disturbance. Instead of taking out the thorn which pricks you, they will drive it further into your foot. Some people, when they are ill, or in trouble, or injured by anyone, restrain their complaints, because they think, and that rightly, that to murmur betokens great weakness or a narrow mind. But nevertheless, they exceedingly desire and maneuver to make others pity them, desiring to be considered as suffering with patience and courage. Now this is a kind of patience, certainly, but it is a spurious patience, which in reality is neither more nor less than a very refined, very subtle form of ambition and vanity. To them we may apply the Apostle's words, He hath whereof to glory, but not before God. A really patient man neither complains nor seeks to be pitied. He will speak simply and truly of his trouble, without exaggerating its weight or bemoaning himself. If others pity him, he will accept their compassion patiently, unless they pity him for some ill he is not enduring, in which case he will say so with meekness, and abide in patience and truthfulness, combating his grief and not complaining of it. As to the trials which you will encounter in devotion, and they are certain to arise, bear in mind our dear Lord's words, A woman, when she is in travail, hath sorrow, because her hour is come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish, for joy that a child is born into the world. You too have conceived in your soul the most gracious of children, even Jesus Christ, and before he can be brought forth, you must inevitably travail with pain. But be of good cheer, for when these pangs are over, you will possess an abiding joy, having brought such a man into the world. And he will be really born for you, when he is perfected in your heart by love, and in your actions by imitating his life. When you are sick, Offer all your pains and weaknesses to our dear Lord, and ask Him to unite them to the sufferings which He bore for you. Obey your physician, 
and take all medicines, remedies, and nourishment, for the love of God, remembering the vinegar and gall he tasted for love of us. Desire your recovery that you may serve him. Do not shrink from languor and weakness out of obedience to him, and be ready to die if he wills it, to his glory, and that you may enter into his presence. Bear in mind that the bee, while making its honey, lives upon a bitter food, and in like manner we can never make acts of gentleness and patience or gather the honey of the truest virtues better than while eating the bread of bitterness and enduring hardness. And just as the best honey is that made from thyme, a small and bitter herb, so that virtue which is practiced amid bitterness and lowly sorrow is the best of all virtues. Gaze often upon Jesus Christ, crucified, naked, blasphemed, falsely accused, forsaken, overwhelmed with every possible grief and sorrow, and remember that none of your sufferings can ever be compared to his, either in kind or degree, and that you can never suffer anything for him worthy to be weighed against what he has borne for you. Consider the pains which martyrs have endured, and think how even now many people are bearing afflictions beyond all measure greater than yours, and say, Of a truth my trouble is comfort, my torments are but roses as compared to those whose life is a continual death without solace, or aid, or consolation, borne down with a weight of grief tenfold greater than mine. End of Part 3, Chapter 3 Recording by Lisa Feltis Part 3, Chapter 4 Introduction to the Devout Life This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lisa Feltis Introduction to the Devout Life by St. Francis de Sales Part 3, Chapter 4 On Greater Humility Elisha bade the poor widow, Borrow vessels, even empty vessels, not a few, and pour oil into all those vessels. And so in order to receive God's grace in our hearts, they must be as empty vessels, not filled with self-esteem. The swallow with its sharp cry and keen glance has the power of frightening away birds of prey, and for that reason the dove prefers it to all other birds, and lives surely beside it. Even so, humility drives Satan away, and cherishes the gifts and graces of the Holy Spirit within us, and for that reason all the saints, and especially the King of Saints and His Blessed Mother, have always esteemed the grace of humility above all other virtues. We call that vainglory, which men take to themselves, either for what is not in them, or which being in them is not their own, or which being in them and their own yet is not worthy of their self-satisfaction. For instance, noble birth, favor of great men, popular applause, all these are things now wise, belonging to ourselves, but coming from our forefathers or the opinions of others. Some people are proud and conceited because they ride a fine horse, wear a feather in their hat, and are expensively dressed. But who can fail to see their folly, or that if any one has reason to be proud over such things, it would be the horse, the bird, and the tailor? Or what can be more contemptible than to found one's credit on a horse, a plume, or a ruff? Others again pride themselves upon their dainty mustaches, their well-trimmed beard or curled hair, their white hands, or their dancing, singing, and the like. But is it not a petty vanity which can seek to be esteemed for any such trivial or frivolous matters? Then again, some look for the world's respect and honor because they have acquired some smatterings of science, expecting all their neighbors to listen and yield to them and such men we call pedants. Others make great capital of their personal beauty, 
and imagine that every one is lost in admiration of it. But all this is utterly vain, foolish, and impertinent, and the glory men take to themselves for such matters must be called vain, childish, and frivolous. You may test real worth as we test balm, which is tried by being distilled in water, and if it is precipitated to the bottom, it is known to be pure and precious. So if you want to know whether a man is really wise, learned, generous, or noble, see if his life is molded by humility, modesty, and submission. If so, his gifts are genuine, but if they are only surface and showy, you may be sure that in proportion to their demonstrativeness, so is their unreality. Those pearls which are formed amid tempest and storm have only an outward shell, and are hollow within, and so when a man's good qualities are fed by pride, vanity, and boasting, they will soon have nothing save empty show, without sap, marrow, or substance. Honor, rank, and dignity are like the saffron, which never thrives so well as when trodden under foot. Beauty only attracts when it is free from any such aim. Self-conscious beauty loses its charm, and learning becomes a discredit and degenerates into pedantry when we are puffed up by it. Those who are punctilious about rank, title, or precedence both lay themselves open to criticism and degradation, and also throw contempt on all such things, because an honor which is valuable when freely paid is worthless when sought for or exacted. When the peacock opens its showy tail, he exhibits the ugliness of his body beneath, and many flowers which are beautiful while growing wither directly we gather them. And just as men who inhale mandragora from afar as they pass, find it sweet while those who breathe it closely are made faint and ill by the same, so honor may be pleasant to those who merely taste it as they pass, without seeking or craving for it, but it will become very dangerous and hurtful to such as take delight in and feed upon it. An active effort to acquire virtue is the first step towards goodness, but an active effort to acquire honor is the first step towards contempt and shame. A well-conditioned mind will not throw away its powers upon such sorry trifles as rank, position, or outward forms. It has other things to do, and will leave all that to meaner minds. He who can find pearls will not stop to pick up shells, and so a man who aims at real goodness will not be keen about outward tokens of honor. Undoubtedly, everyone is justified in keeping his own place, and there is no want of humility in that so long as it is done simply and without contention. Just as our merchant ships coming from Peru with gold and silver often bring apes and parrots likewise, because these cost but little and do not add to the weight of a cargo, so good men seeking to grow in grace can take their natural rank and position, so long as they are not engrossed by such things, and do not involve themselves in anxiety, contention, or ill-will on their account. I am not speaking here of those whose position is public, or even of certain special private persons whose dignity may be important. In all such cases each man must move in his own sphere, with prudence and discretion, together with charity and courtesy. End of Part 3, Chapter 4 Recording by Lisa Feltis